Joining me for tonight's Big Picture Rumble are Lori Sanders, Outreach Director for Our Street Institute, Neil Sroka, Communications Director for Democracy for America, and Horace Cooper, Attorney and Senior Fellow at the National Center for Public Policy Research. So why are we letting unelected, amoral, transnational corporations negotiate on behalf of we the people? Man, you, you hate to say I told you so, but when we were fighting fast track for the last 18 months, we said that this uh, trade Trans-Pacific Partnership would be a massive giveaway to corporations, and in particular, be a massive giveaway to pharma corporations. And what we're seeing in these leaked chapters is that's the case. Moreover, if these chapters go through, uh, the people negotiating it and, frankly, the members of Congress who may vote, vote for it have to understand that people will die because they do not have access to these drugs and so that pharmaceutical companies in this country can get richer. Yeah. And that there are clear moral stakes uh, for if, if this ends up being uh, the, the final text uh, of the agreement. It's going to be a real disaster for you know, people across the world. It's interesting Open Secrets did a, uh, you know, a summary, I, th I think it was on Open Secrets, of uh, how much, who got how much money from where, you know, basically for the TPP vote. John Boehner won the competition with 5.3 million. Um, uh, who's the number two guy? Kevin McCarthy was like three and a half million, something like that. There were a couple of people who took over a million dollars and then voted against it, which was interesting. But they also got hundreds of thousands to vote against it. But um, I haven't. But the thing was that virtually all of that money was coming out of Wall Street. I, I, I was not seeing big pharma in there. So I'm wondering, you know, is another shoe going to drop in a month or so? Anyhow, Laura, your thoughts on this? I mean, I actually, this is a place where I agree with you. I know that you and I disagree about whether or not free trade in general is something that's good. But as a pro-free trader, what I want is actually free trade, right? I don't want big pharma to get a special cutout. I don't want any company to get a special cutout. You're completely right that the stakes are incredibly high when you're talking about pharmaceuticals. And here it's not just intellectual property as it relates to pharmaceuticals that we should be concerned about. About. It's about you know licensing and patents and things like that. And why is pharma getting a special deal that, frankly, you know, Google, Microsoft, other companies might disagree with? Why why pharma as opposed to others in how we treat intellectual property? But it shouldn't be anyone. We should just have free trade. I, well, <laughs> I, I, I more or less agree. I, I think that each country should determine the rules of the trade, you know, of trade that they're gonna they're they're gonna operate under. But I'm not opposed to trade. I'm opposed to corporate managed trade and that's what this is I mean this is this you know for us well I guess I take a little bit of a different take um, I don't know that we're going to be able to have our our country simply set the rule without regard to what other countries are doing it's we did always it from a 1791 to 1981 it's always been a managed negotiation as the global trade experience has become a much more dominant concept it has to be managed on both sides of the aisle and that means uh, excuse me both sides of the the land space that's covered and that means that yes you're going to have representatives from Europe and Asia and all of the other participants that's how WTO worked that's how NAFTA ended up working we have people on both sides of the table trying to work out how we can get to the goal. If the goal is only if there's not perfect trade between both parties, we can't have it. You're right, we'll never have any trade agreements. We have but these secret. move us further toward that objective. I mean, I, so I think that I, so I agree with you on one level here, right, which is that, like, yes, you have to go through this negotiation process. There's give and take on both sides. What's problematic to me is that, obviously, we don't see it until it's very late in the game, and you don't know who has access behind right. the scenes. And that's what's, what's more troubling from a libertarian me. perspective. From, from the George Washington administration until the Reagan administration, this country had a continuous trade surplus. We were the largest exporter of manufactured goods in the world in 1980. We were the largest importer of raw material. We brought in coal and ore, and we shipped out televisions and computers. We were the largest creditor in the world. By the end of Reaganism, early Reaganism, by the end of the Reagan and Bush administrations, we had become the largest importer of finished goods in the world. Sam Walton no longer had a sign made in the USA on the Walmart stores. We became the largest exporter of, of raw materials. We became the world's largest debtor. and. I forget what the fourth one was. Oh, and we've racked up an $11 trillion trade debt. And that's not like the national deficit, which is basically mostly personal savings. It's mostly American savings. I mean, 85, 90% of the U.S. debt is money that we owe to Americans. 
But this, 100% of this 11 trillion is owned to foreigners. And this is why one seventh of all assets in the United States are now owned by foreigners. Whereas when Reagan came into office, it was less than a hundredth of all assets in the United States. We've got to clean this trade deficit up. We've got to take it back down to zero. And, and you know, Warren Buffett made a suggestion. He said, how about we say, every time somebody exports something, they get a certificate equal to the dollar value of the export that, you know, and, and for imports, that becomes a permit. And so you have to buy that certificate or that permit from them in order to import something. So imports will never exceed exports. It, Tom so let's Hartman, cap and trade, not at all cap and trade for trade. Trade Tom deficits Hartman, are not you, things that we should care about. Trade, 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 trade deficits are trade destroying deficits are, this country. Tom, that, that, that's how we have a, a problem of manufacturing in this country because of the massive trade deficit going on. No, we have on. a problem let's of be, manufacturing also, because of our let, education let, system let's and because be, of how we treat let's also be really Let's also be really clear about the other repercussions of this. If Republicans care so much, as they consistently do about the rising cost of health care. This, this should be raising alarm bells. This massive giveaway to pharmaceutical companies is only going to massively increase uh, prescription drug costs in this country for uh, consumers, but also for the government, who's one of the largest you know, consumers of, of, of health care. So this should be a big worry for anyone that cares about the rising cost of prescription drugs. Horace, it doesn't bother you that we're $11 trillion in debt to other countries? This is xenophobia masquerading. Oh, this idea that, oh, now it was only a hundredth of these assets were owned by the foreigners. Mr. Trump should bring you onto his campaign to talk about the ills of the foreigners. I welcome Horace, foreign I investment. Conf I confess, I am an American first guy. I, I absolutely confess. I, this is my this country. Is I love this country. Game. I, I am absolutely. Game, Tom. I absolutely. Trade is actual. It's absolutely it's a zero sum game. No, it is not. Read Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Commerce Read on is Labor never by David zero Ricardo. sum. Commerce is never zero sum. It is it's when it's about between nations. Benefit. No, that's not true. That is you absolutely know what? I would true. really, I really enjoy my job, and I'm very glad I don't work in a textile mill. I'm very glad that we found places where we can produce things cheaper, where we're giving people who need jobs those jobs. And I agree, we have a problem and with we manufacturing. Have you and I have talked about this who, before. Who would love to have a job in a textile mill? Certainly, but the problem with the way the, the problem with manufacturing in this country is not because we've exported all of those jobs. It's how we treat education. It's how we treat worker training. We have training. lost sixty thousand factories since two thousand. Exactly, but Just it's because we don't have a free market here that allows us to be the comparative no, advantage not. country no, when it comes to manufacturing. The comparative is advantage correct. is because we, we, you know, we dropped tariffs, and, and, and by the way, the other countries didn't. Well, Germany that we, made it that we don't have export. a comparative advantage if we need to have higher tariffs. If you, the point is exactly. that Exactly. Tariffs we could are not how you get an advantage. You get an right. advantage by having an unregulated market that's exactly with people right. who are there, highly educated there, and can take correct. those there jobs. There are no, well, it's, you know, it's a nice von Mises, Hayek, uh, you know, Milton Friedman. It's the reality. But it has never been demonstrated. Demonstrated to work on. anywhere in the world. And, and because of cronyism, because of corporations no, no, doing yeah, bad things. It doesn't work. No, it's it a does fantasy. work. It's a Paul Ryan. So Hong Kong, is, Hong Kong is not working, right? Right. right? Like, Hong, is that, Hong is that Kong not working? Is, Hong Kong is. Singapore. All of those tigers, those Asian tigers, demonstrate that if you unleash Hong Kong was innovation. Not manufacturing, they were mercantilists. This is, you know, if, if we want to be a mercantilist nation, if you want to replicate the British East India Company, yeah, you can make a lot of money doing that. But, you know, Hong Kong was just a trading point. I've been in Hong Kong. I've done business in Hong Kong. If and, foreigners and, and, want to come into my neighborhood and buy a house next to me, I welcome it. It'll make the value of the properties go up for everyone. It is you if, guys if they want to who buy take xenophobia and in pretend America, it's, it's America not happy. First I'm and, not happy build, with it. Build, because well, when, when they buy our businesses, where does the profit go, go Horace? Abroad. If you have a dollar bill, you can only use a dollar bill in an environment where dollars are important. When people come that's to America, that's my point. That's no, why. No, no, that's no. why that no, eleven trillion dollars has to be redeemed here in the United States. Anywhere on the planet, if they're holding dollar bills, that's value that will someday come to the United States. That's basic economics. As, as and our this is assets the go away, this yeah. is the problem. More of tonight's big picture rumble after the break. I'm Wolf Blitzer, and you're in, you're in the situation. Not now for the ridiculous, not for the ridiculous. Elect Republicans, and they will burn, burn place down. This is my problem with liberal, liberals. I'm the resident. Let's talk about that. I 
think the shutdown's pathetic, Larry. We shouldn't have to pay taxes then, should we? Good idea, Jesse. But have no fear. Because the billionaire oligarchs are here. What if there were a country in which the government operated outside of constitutional rule? 40% of the food that we produce in the country never makes it into our mouths. How much fallout do you think this is going to create for the CIA? Do you think this is what's triggering the crisis? America's the largest economy in the world. It's also the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. I need to know what to be terrified of. There is nothing scarier than not knowing what to freak out about. And then if they were working toward the American dream, the next they were just trying to survive the night. It's time for Americans and lawmakers in Washington to wake up and start talking about the real causes of poverty in America. I'm a fighter. I can take a punch. I live. I learn something every day. I strike when I need to strike. I prepare. I've earned everything I have. If I fall, I get back up. I won't be underestimated. I'm Aaron Aid, and I put the boom into Boom Bus. Still with me are Laurie Sanders, Neil Sroka, and Horace Cooper, and let's get back to it. The Supreme Court announced that it will hear a case during its next term about what are called fair share service fees for public sector employees. Fair share service fees are fees that me non-union members, people who work in a union workplace, are represented by the union by law. In fact, the union has to pay for lawyers to defend them if they have a dispute with their em employer. Uh, these are fees that they pay to the union in the workforce to make up for the fact that they're receiving the benefits of a union, like higher wages and more comprehensive benefits, and those lawyers who will defend them. But they don't pay union dues. So if workers can choose not to pay these fees and still get the benefits, more people will choose that free ride, and the unions are likely to go bankrupt. So the real questions here are, are conservatives, or probably more specifically Republicans, since unions are the major funders of Democratic candidates, are conservatives or Republicans trying to encourage public employees to freeload? Or are they hoping that the unions will fail so that we can pay teachers, postal workers, and police officers sweatshop wages and defund the Democratic Party? Yeah, I mean, I, this is clearly, this has been a 30 to 40 year mission to end power. Oh, this goes back this to Taft Hartley. I mean, yeah, it, as far as, I, I mean, and, and what's here is, what's interesting is that more often than not, the argument against this is it, it's on free speech terms that you know folks should have the right to free speech and therefore uh, these fair pay you know fair share laws are, are unconstitutional but the question is is that those free speech contingents wouldn't hold if you had a worker individually talking to a boss and demanding a raise if the boss said well I don't want to talk to you about this raise right now uh, would that person be allowed to sue for violation of their free speech? Probably not. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. It's kind of ridiculous, but frankly, uh, with the Roberts courts being as corporate driven as they are, uh, it's, it's a very scary moment for uh, unions in this the country. Thing, the thing that I find interesting about this is how whenever, whenever I've debated this with conservatives, I did it today with a guy from, from a local think tank, um, they constantly try to conflate two things. Um, ever since Taft-Hartley, if a union does anything that's political or lobbying, union members, people who are paying fees, can say, don't, don't take that money out of my paycheck. I don't want to participate in your lobby and I don't agree with it. And you know, and if more than 51% of those people say that, they can just end the union, which happened in a radio station that I worked in and you know, a clear channel station up in Portland once. Um, this is not what we're talking about. Yeah. What we're talking about is just paying for the, you know, the work that the union is doing. Right, but I don't, what I don't understand is the problem with the idea that unions should have to make their case to people. Unions should have to make their case. You should have to want to join a union. It shouldn't by default, I'm part of this union. I mean, if you well, think unions are so valuable, it's, it's, if unions are, are so incredibly valuable, then when workers get the chance to opt in, opt out, and choose whether or not to pay those dues, unions should be able to make their case that, you know, for us to be able to continue, for us to be able to continue to bring you all the benefits that we're supposedly bringing you, we need your fees. 
right? That's how every, you know, organization works when you are working on a fee basis, right? Like I'm a nonprofit, I work for a nonprofit. We have to make our case continually to people that if they want our work to continue, they need to contribute. Right. And so unions should have to make that case. And if unions are as great as you seem to think they are, they should be able to effectively make that case to people. The same way when you hear the NPR drive of if you don't give, we're going to go off the air. If you appreciate there's, there's us, a, there's please a big give. difference here though, and that is that under the law an employee can go to the union and say, I have a grievance against my boss, you will defend me, you will fight for me, you will spend $100,000 in legal fees on my behalf. And if the union says no, the employee can sue the union, right, and, and put the union out of business. The union is required to defend every single employee, whether they're a member Tom, or not. Tom, and the unions all... demanded that responsibility. No, the union didn't have it's that in the wagon on them. The, it's been they there since 1935. It imposed on them. They demanded it as a way of showing that they are the best represented for Which the employee. Which is fine. But unions are point, democratic institutions, Chorus. If people if don't want the union, vote it out. Yeah, you can't. You, can, you can always decertify a union. That's you possible. decertify a yeah, union. It's possible. In a free society, you get to decide all of these kinds of choices, even in a given workplace, whether or not you wish to be represented in any way by the organization. And so, no, if no. the the union, I'm sorry, you can't. The, the union can fix your unions unions problem. You the union can fix your problem by simply no, asking it's to have the law changed. Fifty-one percent vote. The unions could ask to have the law changed that says, okay, those folks that don't want to pay anything at all, then we will have no longer any responsibility. And you know what will happen? A cascade of people will choose not to be represented in any way, shape, or form, and they know it. And then their wages will disintegrate, and they'll be looking yeah. around, going, hey, what happened? But if that yeah. were true, then you wouldn't need. That is coercion. true. Look at, look at, look at all the non-unionized yeah, shops yeah. right now. I mean, you know, in, in, when Reagan came into office, the, <laughs> my favorite, um, the, the number one employer in the United States was General Motors. They were paying $54 an hour in today's wages. And, and now the number one employer in the United States is Walmart, not unionized, and they pay $9. And, and, right and General right Motors went out of business right in Detroit and then shambles. And right now we know because, because of our trade policy. Did. So no, because of right. what no, unions did. No, because Japan will not Detroit allow us to import in cars into Japan. Yeah. South Korea will not allow us to import cars into South Korea. Germany won't allow well, us to import cars. Well, good thing we're going to have TPP. We'll fix yeah. that Tom, problem. No. Tom, we've See, had this conversation before. You progressives have done everything you can to cripple companies that manufacture, and then when they don't have a comparative advantage internationally, you go around nonsense. crying and say, we need to set up barriers. That, that is absolute nonsense. Well, the, Jim, General Motors the, is the a good 63, example. 63,000 factories we have lost in the United States are not the result of any liberal policies at all. They are the result, oh, uh, unless you want to call Bill Clinton a liberal, because Gen he signed NAFTA. General Motors is the example writ large of what happens when the progressives come after a corporation and mandate and uh, mandate, yeah. and mandate, sure. and mandate, and mandate. Yeah, I grew if up in Michigan, them... Horace. I remember the 70s, when we, the late 70s and the early 80s, when we first started this whole free trade thing with cars, and Toyota was coming in, and, and Honda was coming in, and people were keying cars. You know, they were do all one thing right now. You can do one Georgia, thing right now. Exempt General Motors for five years from CAFE. Just exempt them, and you would see a 15 to 20 percent growth in the bottom line, the number of employees that they and would have. People would die. Of, of the, of the, <laughs> die from what? Are, what isn't cafe, cafe is, is cafe is fuel economy. Oh, fuel economy. Right, I thought you were talking about safety standards. Yeah, yeah, just exempt them from that. Yeah, exempt yeah. them from that. Yeah. That's you great. progressives, great. instead right. of doing that, time. have crippled companies right. just like them. The, the cafe steel. standards apply to Toyota just like they do to General Motors. And the fact yes, of the matter is that in, in Europe, from the average, where that kind the average of product fuel economy is better than any, anywhere in the United States. No, it's not. That it's product not. in Japan gives them a comparative advantage. No, what is All you got to do is look at car sizes, and you will see you know, this. I, and you if you want to debate the auto industry, I mean, you know, the simple fact of the matter is you've got well, a bunch of foreign steel. car companies we who came over about. here. We had a bunch of governors, Democrats and Republicans, who said, oh, yeah, we'll give you 10 years of no taxes. We'll give you millions of dollars for the yeah, free land. Yeah, to be clear, they shouldn't Just do that. A, I, they shouldn't I agree. do that. I think it should be I'm outlawed. I'm with you there. I think if any state well, competes with any other state, they should lose their federal highway funds. I mean, you know, they would put an end to it tomorrow. But but what what happens is these foreign companies come over here, they make cars here, and they take all the profit home. You can't that's take the problem. A dollar yeah. bill. Yes, you can. From you can United take it from States. communities that are no, that are, no that's not. Not. Uh, uh, a dollar. Not dollar. You, so you're saying Absolutely a dollar spent not. on Main Street is not unless more valuable it, than a dollar spent in Walmart? Unless you burn it, that's the ridiculous. Dollar stays that's absurd. That's just not true. That's false. What you're saying? That's just not true. What you're saying? A dollar spent on Main Street is a lot less valuable because you can buy more at Walmart. When it circulates within 
a community. I, I've seen small towns in New England die when their main street dies and a Walmart comes in. And that's because there were jobs in that local municipality that were pay well paying jobs that circulated dollars consistently no, throughout communities. I have communities. been so poor that Walmart was the only place I could shop before. Okay. And, and so I appreciate nothing more than the fact that my dollar went further, helped me feed my son, yes. helped me feed my family, Absolutely. helped me keep my house going Which at a time that was is very difficult for me. So if you would take Walmart the, away from me, and at the end I don't think anyone's that. talking about taking but Walmart away from me. What we're is, saying is there's more value you in local jobs Sam Walton's than there are in jobs that export profits to either big businesses or abroad. Sam Walton's original slogan was made in the USA. It was it a giant banner. Was. Because back then we could make things in the USA cheaply and we can't now because of That's regulation. That's exactly no, my point. No, it has got nothing and to do with regulation. So when you add regulatory before, burden onto businesses and they have to pay money to comply, how does that not raise prices? If the reg it does. It absolutely does. If the regulatory So we want burden, to raise prices the and then if, if and we then scream do, and yell when things go away, if, when people say, I want to do this cheaper and more efficiently, you raise prices and you if, think there will just be no effect? If, if you were to... You can't have everything, The Tom. regulatory burden that I'm in favor of, that I'm speaking for, and by the way, I doubt that you can name maybe boy, cafe standards, one that is actually diminishing the activity of American business. But the, the regulatory burden that I'm talking about is, is things like China and Japan and South Korea and Taiwan and every European country saying we're going to use VAT taxes as effective tariffs, 30% tariff effectively. We're going to use uh, uh, domestic content standards. We're going to, you know, we used to have a law, actually still on the books, 1935, by a USA Act. 20% of our economy is the federal government. The federal government is mandated by law to always buy from an American manufacturer. Unless the only president, let me finish this sentence. Let me finish this sentence. Let me finish this sentence. Unless the president issues a waiver. And in the 1980s, Reagan started issuing these waivers like they were paper. And they have, and they, and the they reason which they were. Was and when we're paying $300 for a hammer at the Defense Department, no, that's we not the need reason. To look not why that's $300 not the reason. That's cost insane. alternatives. That's what you're that talking was, about corporate fraud. Yeah. I get that. No, you know, in the I'm defense talking industry. About that's not what I'm talking created about. created disadvantage for American companies. And you can't have it both ways. You can't artificially raise the cost of doing business and then cry when people look at alternatives that give them a lower cost somewhere else. Yeah. And also, allows okay. them to provide cheap goods that keep poor people in America yes. afloat. Yes. Right. But but see, Look if, so the, if the, the prices went up, the wages go up more. Yes. Look that's at my that. point. That's exactly that the prices. Point. Prices in Germany are higher. <laughs> wages are higher. Prices in, in Japan are higher. Correlation wages does not are equal higher. causation. That's wages true. were much higher She's here correct. in the United States when prices were higher. Labor is a small cost of the part GDP of the cost of anything. So as is a as, far better me uh, measure. And if you compare America's GDP, no, it's not GDP, because it includes yes, fraud. Absolutely. It includes banksters. It includes oh. all kinds of activity that you really don't want. It includes all the bonds. I want bank activity. I mean, go back. Listen. I listen, want corporate listen to Robert Kennedy's speech on GDP someday. It's it's. Uh, you know, it measures I, I Richard Speck's rifle. I that a rising tide raises all boats. Well, you got to have a yacht to start out with there. You know, it's, <laughs> well, it's, he did. Yeah, I know he did. The, the lawsuit between the Washington football team and the five Native American individuals is being cast in a new light. The Supreme Court ruled a few weeks ago that Texas is allowed to ban Confederate flags from its license plates if it deems the symbol offensive. The individuals are claiming that this bolsters their case because the Washington team's name and logo are offensive, but the team is claiming that they're two different cases and the use of the logo is protected as pure private speech. Team lawyers claimed a Coke can is not a license. So, should we be able to trademark and advertise slurs under the protection of pure private speech? We've got about a minute and a half. <laughs> I was very thrilled that Justice Thomas joined in to say that the state of Texas didn't have to promote the Confederate flag if it didn't want to. Right. Um, when, when Justice Thomas also said that burning a cross in someone's yard was pure hate speech not protected by the First Amendment, the progressives on the court refused to join him with that. Now, if you tell me that you believe that this name of the Washington Redskins is pure hate speech, have, then I have, would agree with we you. Have, we have I don't 20 think seconds I'd like to hear from our other uh, Neil. I mean, there's just a difference between the state engaging in an activity and it being a state-sponsored activity and, and something being private. Now, I th do. if the Redskins logo is offensive, I hope that the market pushes it out. But that's not exactly the government's role, as opposed to the government in Texas literally explicitly supporting case, something that's hateful. You've got one crazy owner who they're, wants yeah. to hold on they're, to this. They're, sure, they're, I'm, I'm in no way attached Laurie, to Neil, the Laurie, Neil, Horace, thank you all for being here. Thank you.